Stacy. Hi, I'm Dave Dietrich, founder and president of International Time Machines, and I'd like to welcome you to my clock shop of master clocks from the early 1900s. Many of these clocks were made by International Time Recording, which was the predecessor of IBM in the early 1900s, actually the late 1800s is when they began. Today I'm going to be taking a look at weight-driven master clocks, which were the most accurate timekeepers of the master clock collections on the market from around 1910 to about 1950, really at the dawn of the industrial age. I have about 13 of the weight-driven ITR master clocks, and we'll take a closer look at several of them and the technology and the aging, age progression throughout those decades. I hope you enjoy it. Here in the clock shop, we have all kinds of master clocks. The one in the center is actually an international spring-driven master clock, and it's flanked by weight-driven master clocks by international on either side. On the left side, you see what had been a mercurial pendulum, uh, which is now running with some bottles and 13-inch weights. And on the right-hand side, there is a brass bob pendulum, 60 beat a minute also, with 10-inch weights. We'll start off by taking a look at the actual mechanics of how the weight driven rewinds the weights when they've run down due to the uh, progression of time. This international time recording weight driven master clock has had its weights run all the way down. I've had the rewind motor turned off uh, so that the weights would drop all the way down. Uh, it's also running with a couple of Grey Goose vodka bottles instead of the Mercury pendulums and that's just for convenience but uh, some people kind of like the way they look as well. When I activate the motor you'll see the weights begin to rise as the motor kicks in and slowly turns the weights back up towards the movement. You can hear the motor running as it pulls the weights up Generally, they're about this noise level. Sometimes they're noisier, sometimes they're quieter. But uh, there's a little fail-safe device in there should there be any problems with the weights. And there's an automatic shut-off when it reaches the top. Several of the weight-driven master clocks that are here in the clock shop are worth taking a note on. Many of them have the paneled sides such as you see on this one. This happens to be the oldest clock, weight driven clock that I have. I can tell that because of the serial number of the motor that does the rewinding. It has brass pulleys which are very old. It has a old style switch to engage the rewind motor and several other features which I'll discuss in a moment. In addition to the weight driven, I have some other master clocks here, but the clock with the dial on it, the international weight driven, one of the oldest in the collection, of the third oldest in the collection, from about 1920. A clock from about 1930, weight driven international master clock, spring driven. And this is also one of the older clocks in the collection. This is the uh, uh, second oldest clock. Closer look at a 1930 master clock. It has a general electric motor, which is about 1 70th of a horsepower that does the rewinding. Two oilers automatically keep the uh, gears inside the motor well lubricated. This is a series of electric contact uh, mechanisms down the left hand side that would be used to calibrate wall clocks throughout the facility. The rewind mechanism, the gears, are located on the right hand side. This is a second generation on off switch for the rewind motor. It has black pulleys attached to the cables or holding the cables for the weights which is also a third generation feature of the uh, weight driven master clocks. While many of the components that were used over the four decades in the weight driven movements haven't changed, there are some changes that will help identify the age of the different movements. At the top we'll see an early 1920s movement and at the bottom one from the 1940s. Uh, you can see on the right there's a list of different elements that you can find across the two different uh, generations and we'll take a look at those in more detail next. One easy way to tell a weight driven movement from the early to mid 1920s is the presence of an ITR mark in the center of the movement.
Sometimes you can tell the age of a clock by the manufacturer's plate, either by the generation of the plate or by the serial number if that's included. You can also tell the approximate age of the clock through the pulleys that are used, from the early 20s with all brass to the all black painted in the 1930s and the 40s. Another indicator of a clock's age is the switch that's used to rewind the clock. In the early generation, you could tell from the cover being on that the post is in the top right and it has contact points on the inside. For the later generation, there's a linkage that's visible from the outside and a roller assembly on the inside that completes the circuit. Each master clock sent out an electric impulse once a minute to synchronize wall clocks throughout the facility. The first generation of switch contacts are on the top and on the bottom you see the second generation, a much more advanced and much more reliable switching assembly to keep the slave clocks synchronized. So in conclusion, by taking a look at a lot of the different technologies in a movement, you can determine an approximate age of a weight-driven master clock manufactured by ITR. I hope you've learned a little bit more about International Time Recording's weight-driven master clocks in this video. I'll look forward to putting out more videos to talk about other facets of international master clocks, but feel free to look us up on the internet, internationaltimemachines.net, or give me a call. My number's online as well if you'd like to ask any questions or have any suggestions. Thank you. Goodbye. Stylish marriage.